we have uh, Senator Stuart Cousins, who is the first woman in the history of our state to be majority leader of either of the houses. So we, I, on her behalf, I want to welcome you to the Democratic Senate. This is our special room. We meet here every week to discuss issues. And some of you are here, some of you are not, but this is where we meet once a week besides before we go into the chamber. So welcome. Um, and I want to just thank these two young ladies who in a minute will open up the program, but they came up with this idea. They wanted to share a moment where we could have a chance to talk to you. So they have decided that the, these people on the panel are young people that they have asked to join you and us <clears throat> to talk about, to answer some questions. So I'm very happy. And uh, we, one of our colleagues is also on the panel. I know she's you, looking at the panel. You would think that she is a student herself, but she actually <laughs> is a senator. That's Senator Martinez. Senator Martinez. <laughs> so um, I, I will leave that. I, I want to just a special thanks uh, to Yelitsa. Yes. Yelitsa, thank you very much. Yelitsa was the first one who came up with this idea. And Soweba, Soweba, thank you. you. And these young people are, they are now, like some of you, they are interns. Uh, but as you can see, I have never had this. <laughs> I've never had this in my whole history of being here until Soweba came. <laughs> so Soweba, thank yes. you, you really. Lift. You've already brought power to our to our uh, And Alawai, where's Alawai? Alawai, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I have two of my colleagues, Assemblywoman. This is Assemblywoman uh, 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 Richardson. She stopped by because she is young herself, uh, but I wanted her to stop by so you can see. <clears throat> you, you will be in her shoes probably in one day. So, so come stand wow. up, stand up. This is uh, uh, the <laughs> I think she's the youngest woman in our whole conference. And my colleague, another colleague who is part of the Senate, but she also uh, is here with us every day, um, um, Senator Prasad. Right? <laughs> And, oh, and my staff, Janae, raise your hand. Thank you, Janae. Janae is also, <laughs> Janae is a, an intern transitioning into staff, because she's going to stay with us on staff for a little while longer. So thanks, Janae. <laughs> so with that, again, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Oh, and let me, my chief of staff for the Albany office, Julia. Julia. Hey, Julia. <laughs> didn't see her because she lay standing up. So, <laughs> so um, thank you again. Thank and, you. And, and go ahead. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. My name is Yelitsa Savio. I used to be the session assistant for Senator Monica Martinez, who is so amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, currently, I have just taken up a position with Assemblywoman Latoya Joyner. So I'll be signing with her this upcoming week. Um, my partner in crime, not literally, <laughs> sorry. My partner in crime, not literally, because we don't commit crime. Um, I'll let her introduce herself to you guys. Hi, I'm Sueba Shabazz. I'm currently with Senator Robert Jackson. I'm their legislative aide. I started as a session assistant. Prior to that, I was with Senator Bellman at Montgomery in her district office as an intern. And prior to that, I was with Senator, uh, former Congressman Joseph Crowley. So it's been a journey. <laughs> and here we are today. Um, <laughs> We have a myriad of women, as we had initially hoped for, and uh, we have women that come from all avenues of life. Um, we are very excited for this event because we feel that women don't really have the knowledge they need to get involved in their communities, whether it's with civic engagement, whether it's with policy, and we, we are at a time period when it's important that we learn from real leadership 
and real leaders that have made, made themselves who they are today and they're joining us to speak with you. So feel free to chime in, ask some questions. We'll be asking the panelists some questions, but feel free to, you know, if you have a personal question or you want any advice or anything to following after we ask questions, feel free to chime in at any point. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll now let the um, panelists introduce themselves, starting with you. Hi, I'm Christina Romeo. I am the co-chair and public policy coordinator of Glitz in the Capital Region. And I started my organizing experience when I was 19 years old. So I was the co-founder of the Save Our St. Rose movement, which after 23 tenured faculty were fired and 28 programs were cut, I organized a student movement that created a better communication channels between faculty, administration, and students, which did not exist on my <coughs> campus beforehand. And then moving forward, it's just campaigning in my heart and my blood. So I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy you guys have chosen me to be here. So. <laughs> hey, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Raquel Sadler. I am council and committee director for the original power broker, Senator Valmanette Montgomery. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to be here. And I kind of started my political experience when I was, I think, nine years old, when I used to come to caucus weekend with my mother. Um, I went to SUNY Albany and I was a White House intern um, and then I just, you know, volunteered in the Senate and then I worked in the Senate uh, for Senator, then Minority Leader Stuart Cousins um, and then I came back as a fellow and then halfway through my fellowship I was offered the opportunity to start as Senator Montgomery's counsel. My name is Monica Martinez, New York State Senator. Prior to that, I was a Suffolk County legislator. Prior to that, I was an assistant principal. Prior to that, I was a teacher, social studies teacher. Prior to that, I was a student who went to Binghamton University, which was um, quite exciting, dual major in biology and, and history. Wow. And then prior to that, I was just a kid. <laughs> My luck, I follow the wonderful senator. Um, hi. Um, my name is Joanna Garcia. I am currently the chief of staff for Senator Robert Jackson. Um, before becoming his chief of staff in the Senate, I was executive director under government affairs for City College CUNY. Uh, I was also the chief of staff for then council member Robert Jackson. Before that, I was his uh, legislative and budget director. Uh, I have founded my own not-for-profit um, to support early childhood um, and, adoles and prevent adolescence um, teen pregnancy, uh, and uh, I am a founder and the president of the Uptown Community Democrats, a progressive new club in Washington Heights, north of Manhattan, uh, and I am also the president of Community Education Council, which is the local school board in our neighborhood. Hi everyone, my name is Tori Kelly. I'm Chief of Staff to State Senator Andrew Bernardis. Um, prior to that, I worked for Assembly on a Body for six and a half years as Communications Director. Um, I'm also a Democratic District Leader in the 49th Assembly District. And um, last year, I founded uh, the Sexual Harassment Working Group, which is a group of seven women and one men who have experienced or reported sexual harassment in the legislature. And so we put forth policy ideas and support uh, legislation. Woo! So, you guys are ready to get started? Yes. Okay, so I have a couple of questions that we're gonna ask the panelists. As she said, feel free to chime in. If you have any questions you wanna ask the panelists yourself, then raise your hands and we'll call on you, okay? So the first question, um, any of you who wanna answer, you can just raise your hand as well. The first question that we have is, what is your definition of a power broker? Oh, I'll start. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I, I definitely think uh, when I hear Power Broker, I think of the book of, uh, about Robert Moses, and I don't think any of us are, are quite like that, but uh, we, we sure wield our power in different ways. I think a Power Broker is anyone who uses their position, their access, their influence, their networks, their effort and energy to get something done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we're all doing up here. We're trying to you know, make some change and for the yeah. greater good, uh, but it can be you know, for anything. But we're, we've, we decided to do for, um, you know, public service. Just to kind of echo Tori's sentiment, I think it's about 
anyone who sees a change that can be made in their community and they leverage and they use their uh, skills, talents, and abilities, whatever they may be, to kind of hone in on that change and take active steps towards making a difference in their community, in their world. Okay. Um, I'll add that um, I think power broker, when I think of the term, I think about actually enhancing power that's there. Um, you first assess the power that you have and then you assess the power that is around you and you make sure that you amplify it um, so that you can use it as a means to an end for a greater good. Okay. All right, so we'll move on to our next question unless anybody wants to, yes, add uh, yourself. Hi, how are you? So I had just, I had a question for, um, as a woman or as a woman of color, um, for elected members, what was the challenge that you faced as um, during your campaign? And for non-elected members, what was the challenge that you faced coming up um, leading to the position that you're in now? What are some challenges that, you know, and how you overcame them? So thank you for that. And it's a great question. And I'm going to start off by giving my definition of a power broker, which then would lead into how my campaign went, because I think it goes hand in hand. Uh, for me, being a power broker is someone who knows their strength, their confidence. But when you show your strength and confidence, that could be seen as a turnoff, especially to some individuals, sometimes men, sometimes women, um, and they'll try to put you down, right? And I think it takes a very special type of person, strong person, to rip those barriers, okay, and those challenges that are put before you because you are powerful, or at least you have certain strengths, and you have communication skills, and you have the ability to bring people together. Some people fear that, right? So I think as a power broker, it's, it's not only just trying to, see for me the word power, I don't like the word power, right? Because for me, power sometimes brings people to a different level where they forget who they're working for, all right? So for me, it's more about strength, and for me, it's more about confidence. And some people take the word power and use it to be, uh, to be oppressive towards others, okay? So for me, that has been um, the biggest thing for me, that if someone says to me, well, you're too strong and you're too this, I actually take that as a positive. And when people have said to me no, I've actually taken that and I've turned it around to make it a yes because I don't like people telling me no. And, and reasons when people say no sometimes is because they feel I can't do it. So for me, that gives me more of a want and a desire to do more and to actually prove them wrong, right? So that's, that's my thing. So when I started running as a, for a Suffolk County <coughs> legislator, I was to people just a teacher, okay? I was just an administrator. What do I know about politics? What do I know about this and that? But what people didn't realize is that as an educator, you see thousands of kids go through you, thousands of families that you meet on a regular basis. No one knew the power okay, that I kind of had in terms of knowing people. So my, quote unquote again, because I don't like the word power, but my strength was that I knew people. I knew families. Kids knew me. I had kids who are now 18 and therefore being able to vote had me in their classrooms, all right? So they knew who I was, their parents knew who I was, and that's how I got elected, right? Because I used the tools that I had, the resources that I had, and when someone said, no, you're just a teacher, you're just an educator, I'm gonna show you the strength that I have as an educator. And that's how I broke that barrier. And aside from that, being a woman of color, I don't see color, I really don't. I see the person. Right? And that's where we need to start getting away from. And look, that's gonna take a long time, all right? Because it's still happening, it's live and well. But when I see someone, I see them for who they are. And the district that I currently represent, it's predominantly, not only Republican, but predominantly non-color, okay? <laughs> what people consider not, you know, colored. And I was still elected, you know? So people need to start looking at the person of what they bring to the table, what they can offer, how they can work, look at past history of work, and then make an intelligent, informed decision on that. But as a woman of color, as a woman as a whole, 
Is it challenging? Of course. But the first moment that we tell someone or agree with someone that I can do it, they already won. Thank you, Sam. That was amazing. <laughs> 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 okay, um, would any non-elected official <laughs> <laughs> like to answer that question? Because it was also for the... <laughs> um, um, but I just wanted to just briefly just thank so Jamal was arrived. So I've worked on campaigns and uh, clearly, you know, becoming president of uh, CEC6 and uh, of the my own Democratic Club um, has been met with many challenges. Um, I I I want a world where there is no color, but I think in our color there is strength also uh, because our diversity um, actually enriches um, all of our collective experiences. Um, and I've been in many situations where. Uh, I am, I've been undermined, my intelligence has been questioned. Um, I really dislike when someone in a very surprised tone says, wow, you're so articulate, uh, as if, you know, that was a surprise to them. Um, I've been in situations where um, I've had uh, my male counterparts work for me and they assume I'm their secretary, um, where there has to be an emphasis that no, she's the chief of staff. Um, and uh, it's a challenge um, that I have to contend with all the time. Uh, it's a challenge when, uh, when it comes to people being surprised that I'm a Latina and that I speak English um, in full sentences. Um, and. Uh, the way that I have contend with it, and I, I want to add another experience, which is very much part of my experience. It's a huge challenge, but it is also what has made me so strong, is that I am a single mother of three children. And I cannot tell you how challenging it is to be civically engaged, to go to community meetings, because you know you have to be there no, you don't get paid, and you have to still, you know, make sure your kids are fed, make sure they do their homework, make sure they're doing well in school, make sure that when you're sitting there fighting and advocating for a community, that you're not neglecting children who are going to grow up and feel like they didn't have a parent at home. So I've, I've had to contend with that. And I'm very proud that my daughter's going to college, she's doing really well, yay, 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 yay. she's 18, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, um, but the world in terms of civic engagement is not made for women. It, it just isn't retrofitted for women because I feel even growing up that um, with three brothers, it was assumed that I'm the one who stayed home to wash their dishes. And actually that's when I became a feminist, when I told my parents, I'm sorry, he ate. <laughs> and he, he, he has two hands where he can wash his own plate and, and cup. Um, so it's been a struggle that, I've, that, I, that I, I actually am used to that has made me stronger. Um, I thank my brothers. They actually made me good at the wordsmithing and, you know, defending myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so the challenge is there, and, but I have learned to really embrace it and know that it has just made me that much stronger. Thank you. I definitely... Oh. <laughs> I definitely, again, want to echo those sentiments. Uh, you know, I just graduated from law school last year, and as many of you may or may not know, 5% of attorneys are African American. And at Albany Law, that was an even lower number because I was one of four or five African American people in the entire class of over 100. So it really, uh, it was a difficult experience because your intelligence is undermined every day by microaggressions that exist in the school, uh, in the school arena and also in the workplace. Um, and I think that kind of owning your knowledge and owning how brilliant you are going out into the world and just knowing that you have something to offer to make the community or the world a better place is something that's so important. Having that support and that backbone and just knowing that you can do literally whatever you want to do. You're not kind of limited, you know, by your circumstance, you know, and don't be close-minded to other people's close-mindedness, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Thank you, Raquel. Um, we'll move on to our next question, unless the audience has a question. Um, so the second question for the panelists is, what were some of the first steps you have taken towards becoming involved with your community? 
So I'll, I'll start. <laughs> so I actually moved to Albany two years ago. And when I first decided to move here permanently, I really thought about what did I need when I was younger? What was lacking in my community back in Long Island that is also lacking in my community here? So I first started with that. And what I realized is that what was lacking when I was younger, and what I would want to be an advocate for, would be LGBTQ students K through 12, because I never had that. And that's why it was harder for me to come out. And that's why I came out later in my life. So when I first realized, OK, that's what I want to do, I actually went straight to Facebook. I talked to people in my community through Facebook. And that's how I realized Glisten existed. And that's how I got first involved. So definitely reach out in your networks when it comes to just like social media. Because mm -hmm. I just went through the events page, and there was, face and there was a Glisten meeting, and I went. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Anybody else? Tori? I found a great way to get involved and in how I did is through um, election campaigns. You, you met a lot of people who are like-minded. You met civic groups, you met other organiza like advocacy organizations that are there at the same time. So it was a great way to get plugged in mm -hmm. um, and learn a lot about the, the community. Yeah. Any question pertaining to that? Okay. So I don't have a question, but yes. can, I, can I make a comment? <laughs> of course. Christina, I am so proud of you, first of all. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm going to tell you why, because, um, it, you know, it, it takes, again, a special type of person, right? And when you're talking about community engagement and how can we get involved, you, you find that one problem that you feel is so special to you and so important to you to get involved, whether for Tory campaign and getting who's, who's someone good to be in office or you who found something personal and you didn't have the support system. I think is what's important. I think in order for people to get involved, you look at that one thing that you're missing, right? And, and how can you change that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And how can you go about effectuating that change? And you know, being in the schools and, and having worked with students of the LGBTQ community, um, you're right, the resources aren't there. And Long Island has made great strides yeah. and across the state to really incorporate right. um, that community, okay, because it's, it has been, has been neglected. Yes. And, it, and it's very unfortunate. So I, I just want to say I'm very proud of you. And, oh, and, and, thank you, and Senator. Thank you for <laughs> doing that because you have become the voice for those up here who did not have it before. Thank so. you. That's the teacher that comes out in me. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions in the audience? Yes, Senator Robert Jackson, <laughs> also one of the sponsors. First, I want to thank the panelists for being a panelist and being able to open up some of the things uh, that people may have not have known about you. But here's a question. Understanding where you are now, attorneys, state senator, chief of staff, what other political or civic goals do you have um, uh, in the future for yourselves? Uh, if you want to be able to share that. Some people don't want to put things out there, but I'm asking the question to see how you respond. Thank you. I want to be a senator. At some point, I kind of want to get into civil rights litigation um, and kind of being a voice for the voices on that side. You know, not a lot of attorney, not a lot of African American attorneys are litigators, as I said, and I kind of want to see how I can contribute to making a difference in that arena and kind of using my experience in the political uh, realm to, you know, make even more of a difference in that way. Thank you. For me, everything that has happened in my life has happened when it should happen. Uh, certain doors have opened at certain times in my career. And as a Suffolk County legislator, I, I, I didn't even know this door was gonna open to the New York State Senate, and it did, but when a door opens, I take it. Mm -hmm. I, I step in. I may say no a couple of times first, uh, <laughs> but then, but then I, I, I go full in. But as of right now, there's a lot of things that I need to do to make the district that I represent better. Uh, so right now, I am good where I am. <laughs> you are so awesome. Senator <laughs> <laughs> Bailey? Um, oh, sorry. Did you? No, I have to, I have to okay. 
Um, I read somewhere recently that there's this statistic where uh, a woman has to be asked, I don't know how many times more uh, than a male to run for office. Um, <laughs> And uh, you know, the senator, when she opened up, she talked about her own life experiences and how she connected and met so many different people. Um, and you know, I have to admit, for a confession, I cringe when my boss asked that question because I felt like he was asking me. Um, <laughs> uh, but maybe he wasn't. Uh, uh, but I I've been asked, uh, and I have said no many, many times to running uh, for New York City Council. Um, and the senator just mentioned that when a door opens, you take advantage of that. And I feel that I owe it to the experience that I've had. I owe it to my three children, and I owe it to the work that I feel that I have paved in my community uh, to run for city council. Yeah, yeah. Start raising money. <laughs> <laughs> You're here to hear first, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, this is not a cop out to the question, but I'm absolutely doing what I want to be want, what I want to be doing. I've worked really hard to get to where I am as chief of staff for Senator Gernardis. Um, You know, I like most kids when they are you know young adults, they have a five year plan. I had a few detours on mine that took me a pretty long a longer time to get here. So I'm just going to really soak up um, where I am and enjoy it and make the most of it. Um, how do you bridge the gap from civic engagement where you're not getting paid and you're just trying to like be civically engaged, get your community aware of issues, get them to participate? Um, how do you bridge the gap from that into to actually holding the office when there, you may be in a community that's not um, open to women or black women being in office? And um, how do you get around the, the DNC convention? Like how do you, what, how, what, is, <laughs> what is the, how do we break that barrier? Because that's a huge barrier to entering into politics for young black women um, is getting past the boys club, as well as um, having a community that's gonna back you when it goes up against the boys club. That is such a good question. <laughs> it, it is a great question. Um, I, what I would do and what I have done, you speak to the party within that district, right? Within the party chairman, chairperson, whomever, uh, to really talk about what your ideas are. And, and look, and we said before, change has taken time, but we're in a moment right now that women really have the ability to come out and, and, and really make great strides. And I think even though we're still living in a man's world, we have broken a lot of barriers. Mm -hmm. We have broken ceilings. And I think we've shattered ceilings, actually. And I think we can do more of. I think, in my opinion, is that we need to let go sometimes of that fear that we as women sometimes have, um, that we are afraid how we're gonna be looked at, how are we gonna be judged. Um, but the only ones who can do that, it's us, right? And you need to be persistent. They tell you no, that's not a good enough answer for me. Tell me why. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you're telling me no. And don't tell me it's because I'm a woman, and please don't tell me because I'm black. Or, or brown, or, you know, don't, don't, that's not a reason. Tell me because I'm not experienced, or tell me because I don't have enough behind me to say I can't do this. Give me a legit reason, but that's not a reason for me to accept. And I think we need to be that persistent and not take no for an answer. And that's the only way, in my opinion, we're gonna bring that, you know, bridge those, that, that gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my ment one of my mentors is uh, Judge Christina Reba, and she's uh, the Supreme Court uh, judge for the third appellate district, which is like Albany, and it goes all the way upstate. And she won overwhelmingly in, you know, a very predominantly white district, and it's because she said, forget race, you're going to vote for me because of who I am, my breath. And I feel like when you go into your community and you participate in events and you volunteer and you are a part of your community board, you show your dedication. I feel like we're in an age, a political age right now, where you can't, you can't, you can't be fake. 
people mm -hmm. call it out, people see it, and they'll know. But if you're dedicated to what you believe in, you talk to the right people, and you express in your interest in whatever it is that you're passionate about, people will see that, people re will receive that, and in turn, you'll get the votes. It won't matter, your skin color won't matter whether you're a woman or a man, people will vote for you because of who you are and what you believe in. Um, I don't have a question, but I did want to add um, to what her question was. I think it has a lot to do with identity and also passion, you said it. The minute that you understand who you are, you will understand where you're grounded, you're mm -hmm. rooted. So when you're moved into a different environment, it won't affect who you are. And when you have that passion inside of you, it will ignite and it will push you <coughs> towards your purpose. It will push you to where you need to be. So it's kind of like having a car and not having gas, right? If you don't have the passion, you won't get to your purpose. But if you know who you are and you go into the political arena, you won't be moved. You know, you won't be, uh, you won't be moved by the payment you won't be moved by the people. You won't be moved by the naysayers because it doesn't matter. You understand who you are and you know that you have the passion that you need in order to meet the purpose. So, so. Yeah, you should be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and thank you for adding that on because so with with me, I was making very good money as a teacher. I was making very good money as an uh, as an assistant principal. Wow. I've taken major pay cuts to be where I am right now. And even going into the Senate, when I ran, there was no guarantee that there was going to be a, a salary increase. I would have taken an additional $50,000 pay cut to serve the New York State Senate. So again, it's not about the pay. It's not about that. It's about, and you hit it right on the, on the head. You know, It's about that passion and trying to make that change. So good for you. And change isn't an event. It's a process. Right. So I feel like, you know, you can't, and you, all, you also can't change other people, but you can remain true to who you are. Absolutely. And, you know, yep. you'll see the fruits of your labor. There's also something inherent about, um, that we have as women, and it's that we are good at listening. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to underestimate that as a power <laughs> that we have um, in negotiating uh, better situations for us, uh, better positions for the people that we're advocating for. Uh, because when you're civically engaged or when you're running for office or you're trying to land a job where you can kind of do a host of things and advocating uh, for a public sector, you're going to be shocked or surprised sometimes that you share this passion with this group of people, but you're so different in so many other ways. You're like, I don't understand. You know, we're, we're, we agree on this, but how can we be so different? Um, so it's really important to listen because you may go in there and say, I've done the research, I have all these ideas, let me tell you what my ideas are. And when you do that too quickly, you miss an opportunity to truly connect with people, um, to connect with them so they can buy into what you have to offer, and also have them connect with you so that whatever they bring to the table can make you that much stronger. And it could really pivot you further um, to where you want to go. I mean, I also have, I have a little bit of a, a snippet of a story. Uh, so when I was a White House intern, we had the opportunity to like ask the president some questions. And this is something that I take with me wherever I go, whatever I do. Um, I asked him, I said, you know, as president, when you were running for office or when you were, you know, getting ready to kind of start your political career, what advice, in retrospect, what advice would you give to an aspiring politician or an attorney or, you know, someone who wants to be a change in their, a change agent in their community? And it seemed like a simple question, so I thought, but he looked at the floor and he was just, and you, see, you could see that he was in deep thought as he was thinking of his answer. Which president, please? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> for President Obama. <laughs> It was President Obama. <laughs> so his answer, I guess you guys can you know, take a deep breath now. Um, but he said, you know, if you're going to run for office, you don't do it for the fame. You don't do it for the power. Uh, you do it because you want to be, you, you don't do it because you want to be somebody. You run because you want to do something. And I think that is like 
a piece of advice moving forward if you want to be a change agent in your own community to take forward with you because that will just you know really positively motivate everything that you do and I'm sure every single elected official in here can agree that that's part that's the reason why they ran for office so at least in this room <laughs> <laughs> Um, I suppose, how do you get people to take you seriously, I guess for lack of a better word? Uh, you can't win no matter what you do. If you're too smiley or if your voice is too high, then you're weak. Or if you are stern and you don't smile and you don't laugh at corny jokes, then you're cold and off-putting. So I guess what's the happy balance between uh, being pleasant and welcoming and then also taking assertiveness and making your presence known. All these questions are great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they really are and I think and, uh, at some point or another we've all experienced that and and I can only tell you about my experiences and I've always been again told no by men and one female and that's a teacher of mine. Okay. Um, and what I've learned in this business, you can't make everyone happy. Mm -hmm. You cannot. You will not. Whether you take a position on one thing and then take a position on another thing and they're two completely different things, uh, you'll never make anyone happy. And I think for me, that's what I've learned. And it's not that I don't care that I'll make people happy, but for me, I know that when I go to bed at night, I've done everything I could mm -hmm. to be and to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So if I can go to bed at night and have a sound sleep <clears throat> and know that I did what I could do within my jurisdiction, I'm okay. And I think when, when you don't make people happy, you're doing something right, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. You're doing something right. And, but for me, what I've always tried to do with anything, and my colleagues can tell you, um, and I think is one of the reasons why um, you know, I, I struggle with this sometimes, but I'm, and I think it's because of my education background and my administrative background, I, I'm the kind of person that I do my homework first, right? And because I need to make sure that I'm doing the right thing and I'm making the right decision and I'm making the right choices. And it may take me a little longer to get to a decision but that's, that's okay, because at the end of the day, I want to make sure that I'm making the right decision, not just for my district, but for me internally, because I need to live with myself with every decision that I make. I remember once I was in a, I was in a meeting. Um, it was a political meeting. It was about strategy, and I'm there listening. I'm taking notes. I make a few comments, and on the way out, it was all men. I was the only woman. Mm -hmm. And on the way out, typical, um, I was told by one of the men, you know, you should smile more often. Um, and I responded, did you? <laughs> um, so uh, I, to me, what that communicated is that that person was intimidated by me being there, my presence, being mm -hmm. a female, and not laughing at the corny jokes. They were corny. Um, so I, you know, I didn't feel like being the, ha ha, that was funny because I was actually, not to be, uh, not to be rude, uh, but I was really focused, just like everyone else in that room, I was really focused on the task at hand. Um, and so what I would say is that be authentic because when you're authentic, Mm -hmm. um, whether your authentic self on Tuesday is a little different from your authentic self on Monday, there's going to be consistency. Um, and that's what you're going to be comfortable with. And it's about finding your own rhythm because that's where you're going to find your power. You're going to get to a point where you're going to say, I'm here to do something right. I'm here to get it done. I'm being kind. I'm being respectful. I'm being professional. And as long as I hit all those three points, it's not my responsibility how it lands on you because I'm doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that you just, you're just accountable for what you do and being authentic. Yeah. Yes, Senator Montgomery. Well, let me just say, can I, will you join me? Isn't this a wonderful panel? Yes. yes. <laughs> I, I, a couple of things that I wanted. I want to first say my compliments so much 
uh, to these two young people. Yeah. 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 And uh, Soeva and Yalitza, they have said they don't want this to be the, the only thing that they do. They, they are looking forward to doing some more of these mm -hmm. kinds of discussions. So that you didn't get all of the questions and everything that you had in your mind, that's what they wanted to, to leave you with. Mm -hmm. They wanted you to want more, mm -hmm. so you'll come back. <laughs> so you guys did a, a great job. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah. And, and I, I want to say to the panel and uh, to the, those of us on behalf of our colleagues, some of whom are here, and I wanted them to make some kind of statement about, you, you know, we need some crazy from the menu, don't we? We, we want to hear from them a little bit. So, but I want to say, we made the right choices because these are all staffers of those of us who represent our constituents and what we try to do, uh, as Senator Martinez has said, we try to be, in order to be able to leave every day feeling that you've done the best that you could, you have to have a very good staff. Let me just say that right in front. So we know the value of people, and we thank you very, very much. Thank you. I do not want you to leave without uh, having an opportunity to hear from some of the colleagues who are here, because um, you're here every day, but you don't see us all the time. But you should know when you're bumping into X, Y, and Z person, uh, you should know how important they are to the people, to you and the people that you represent. So I want to start with my colleague here, who is my sister, and uh, we work together a lot. Would you just say a little bit your district and your, your committee? Good evening, everyone. <laughs> to all the panelists, great work, and we will continue this. Ladies, you did a fantastic job. Um, I'm Senator Roxanne Prasad. I represent the 19th Senatorial District. That's in Brooklyn. So anybody from Brooklyn in the house? Woo! See, Brooklyn's <laughs> always in the house. <laughs> uh, I, I'm the chair of the Social Services Committee, and I encourage all of you just to stay engaged. You ask the questions about how do you get involved in community. It's not just come when you decide to run for office that you want to become involved in community. You should be involved in community every day. That's part of who you are. Mm -hmm. That's part of making things better for where you are and for everyone else surrounding you. So attend your community board meetings, attend your CEC meetings, attend your precinct council meetings, attend any civic meetings in your community so that you get to know what are the needs of the people in your community. So if you could take anything away from this, just find out what is happening in your neighborhood and move from there. Getting involved is easy. Getting to that point mm. is the hard part. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great evening. Um, can I just ask Senator May, and then we'll go to the men. <laughs> <laughs> my other, this is my sister from the middle of the state. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel May. I represent Syracuse and a uh, region around Syracuse. And I chair the Committee on Aging and the Commission on Rural Resources. And this has been an amazing opportunity to learn, for me, to learn about, I know about my city, but I've also learned about farming and all kinds of things. So this, this job has been just an incredible way to learn. But I, I just want to thank all of you for your insights and um, those of you who set this up and yep, the sponsors, because this is such an important dialogue to begin to have. I definitely came up at a time when women weren't expected to do stuff like this. And, and so it really it makes a big difference to get that understanding early so that you can, you can jump out and do everything that you, that you want to do. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. The great senator from the Bronx. Oh. <laughs> Oh, great idea. My name is Jamal Bailey. I'm a state senator, 36th Senatorial District, North Bronx in Mount Vernon. Is the Bronx here? Woo! I knew you were. Woo! Look at that. Roxanne is usually 
right. I, I knew I had it. That's why I, I was waiting, right? It's one of the trainings I had as an attorney. Count and count and count. But in all seriousness, this is such an amazing event. Um, panelists, thank you. This brings you back to, to something that then Senator Light Martinez said when we met. It was the first time I met her, and it was at the um, the it was, it was at a conference in Brooklyn this past this past winter or fall. And she talked about how her classroom experiences got her ready for this level, right? So understand that every step you take is getting you ready for something else, whether you know it or not, right? Um, any J. Cole fans? Right? Love yours, there's beauty in the struggle, ugliness in the success, right? So as you struggle, there's beauty in that struggle. You're going to redefine who you are. You're going to continue to know that pressure makes diamonds. That's what it's going to do. And we, got, we have so many diamonds in this room that pressure is already made based upon your societal conditions that you've already overcome, right? Sometimes, like, we, we say, you know, I'm, I'm a hip-hop guy, and they say, be humble, sit down. But sometimes, <laughs> no, but sometimes, especially as young women, as young women of color, be, don't be humble. Just put your back straight up. Stand proud and tall. And look in the mirror sometimes and say, I did that. It's okay to do that, young ladies. It's okay to do that. Say, I accomplished that. Monica, you won a hell of a race. I did that. You did that. Sure so, did. So, so, <laughs> right? Thank you. You did that. You unseated in, in a very powerful incumbent. You did that. Mm -hmm. Senator Montgomery, I, there's, there's nothing else I can say. You've been doing it. <laughs> <laughs> People like me and Senator Prasad, we can't do the job that we do. We just can't do that job. So understand that there's a role for you, whether it's an elected office or not. But understand that sometimes, even if they, even if they don't want to open the door, sometimes you got to kick the door down. You really do, right? And sometimes the, the knock is not always going to be the loudest. But sometimes you have to have your ear to the door to be listening to, be receptive. And understand that your path is your path, and know it. Be proud of it. Stand in it and stand tall. Be proud. coming out and I hope you've oh, learned you, something you to I hope you've learned something to share with everyone else and uh, Monica thank you for being the leader that you are uh, obviously you're the only senator on this panel but you know this is important that we have a woman senator that can speak from a woman's perspective yep. not from a man's perspective obviously you can because they're not a man but let me just say this that I've worked with Joanna going way back uh, initially, when we were taking a trip to the Dominican Trump Republic, and I asked her to use her artistic talent in order to put together a coloring book that's called Henry of Heiner that talked about the contamination of lead contamination in the Dominican Republic. And she did a fantastic job. I just gave her the pictures and the ideas, and she went with it. And so that's when I offered her my director uh, of legislative affairs in the city council and just her growth and development over the years. And I, I feel that she is highly qualified to be an elected public official, whether it's the city council, state assembly, state senate, it doesn't matter. Because knowing her over the years, she has displayed the type of you know, enthusiasm and type of grit work in order to get the job done and to stand up and advocate for herself and everyone else. And that's what we want people to do. And so, but she has to make her own decision. And what she said here today clearly indicates that she's going to run for the city council, <laughs> which I'm going to support 110%. But, I, but as you know, Monica, and everyone knows, one thing is what you say, and another thing is what you do. But obviously, when you have your community behind you, it makes the, the community is the wind at your back pushing you forward, and that's what's happening here. Thank you all for coming out. And thank you, ladies, for putting it together. Senator Jackson. Just one more thing. Your committee, but may I say this? That was the slickest move that I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm two of you. So I'm happy. I'm, I'm good with it. <laughs> so I, I, I chaired. <laughs> I chair the city's committee, I am on the education committee, higher education committee, the subcommittee on New York City Department of Education, uh, labor, uh, civil service and pension, and uh, 
something else. That's it. That's enough. I represent Manhattan, the 31st Senatorial District in Manhattan. I know Senator Jackson. Mm -hmm. I also respect you greatly. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't. You know, I do. I mean, you know, it's, 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 you never know how people are going to influence uh, how you see yourself, how you see the world. And certainly, Senator Montgomery, in particular, was the first African-American female senator I'd ever met in my life. When I came up on a caucus weekend many, many years ago, and there she was. And I was like, wow, whoever knew? <laughs> and I'd never seen it, never thought about it. And quite honestly, I never actually thought about being in public life even then. You know, I'd come up for a caucus weekend, but it just, uh, but had I not seen her, I would not have even thought the possibility was something to consider at all. So the fact that you all are already connected and you, you wonderful, uh, young, you know, energetic women thought it was a good idea to do something like this is incredible. And to have a legislature with so many voices, and I'm sure everyone talked to you about what our new class looks like, mm -hmm. including Senator Martinez, mm -hmm. you know, including Senator Jackson, you know, Senator Bailey and, and, and mm -hmm. Senator Prasad are kind of old <laughs> hats now, right? I mean, you know, seriously, right? And you haven't even been here that long. But they're, they're like, they're like the, the, the high school you know, Senator May, Senator Lou, you know, and, and, and just, just, just looking at, at this group of people, so many firsts, you know, I mean, again, Senator, Senator Jackson is, is the first, first Muslim, and Senator Lou, you know, first Chinese American, and Senator, Senator Martinez, uh, first Salvadoran, and, and Senator May, you're the first one we got from your district. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it goes to show that we are in the ceiling break in business. Mm -hmm. We are in the change and transformation business. Mm -hmm. We are in the encouragement and the inspiration business. Mm -hmm. Because we understand that there is much to be done mm -hmm. unless we encourage the voices who will follow hopefully in our path in our footsteps and give you some some legitimate models in which to 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 fashion yourself and of course we don't want you to be like us we just want you to be inspired by us and even if we do dumb things you know so then like okay well, I'm never going to do that <laughs> you know because a lot of the, the things that you know there have been leaders before me some have been very very good some have made mistakes you know you just learn from, from the mistakes as well as the good examples. But it, the fact that you're set and you have so many people who are willing to share their time. I have one who was an intern for me, right, Montel? Yes, Senator. Yes, yeah, she was, and here she is. So I won't take up your time, but I do thank you for your continued interest. Thank you for, for helping us be the best we can. And, uh, you know, I am sure that this experience, even if you don't go or stay into, in public service, will serve you well. I certainly hope so, because we all need you. Wherever you are, we need you. So thank you for spending time with us. Thank you. So we you just... Know, turn it back over to our... Uh, to uh, leaders, and again, thank you very much. I'm very proud. Thank you, Senator. And Senator Martinez, thank you very much thank for you. agreeing to hold down on behalf of the, the members. <laughs> so we'll just wrap up with the one last question, uh, which each of the panelists, if they can just answer briefly, um, being that we're on a time constraint. Um, so the question is, what is one advice you would give to the women in this room whether it's life advice or whether it's regarding civic engagement or policy making, starting with Christine. So my advice to you all is that your vulnerability is always your strength. Mm -hmm. And whoever will convince you that being made of stone will make you successful, they're lying to you. 
so just oh and i'm not saying like like wear your soul on your sleeve but know that your story has merit and your lived experience is your expertise mm -hmm. and carry that throughout whatever you guys will end up doing without your journey thank you, thank you. um i think i'm torn between two different uh two different pieces of advice that kind of merge together to make one really good piece of advice, I think. <laughs> um, one is never give up, never give in, never, never, never. Uh, never take no for an answer. And you know, when I was in pre-K at Hanson Place in the Senator's District, um, they taught us, you know, if someone says no, you can't, say, yes, I can. <laughs> and even though, you know, we were so small when we learned that little phrase, I take it with me, you know, even till today, so that's it. Thank you. What I would tell you um, is that you need to be true to yourself, to who you are. And the one thing that I will leave you with uh, that I have personally used for myself is don't ever, ever compromise your morals, your ethics for anything else mm -hmm. because you need to live with that. So, and uh, Sam Montgomery, if you don't mind, before we move on to Joanna and Tori, I also want to give a big thanks to the men who are in this room, yep. mm -hmm. okay? Yes. Because it takes good men to be behind a good woman. And those who stand with women are great men. So thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. And just know that this majority conference, every single member in this conference is trying to do the right thing. And remember to always do the right things, your morals, your ethics, don't ever compromise those two things. Um, I would say uh, don't let perfection be the enemy of good. Um, you, when you decide to take risk and you need to take risk, um, you're bound to make mistakes, and you can't be afraid of making those mistakes. You're going to make those mistakes, you're going to look at those mistakes, you're going to learn from those mistakes, and then you're going to get back up and try again. And if you're gonna make another 100 mistakes, so be it, but the point is that you have to move forward and know that your path it's going to take you in unexpected directions. It's going to do a detour. It's going to go backwards. And when you think that's it, no more, you're going to get there. Um, so it's, it's the same message of not giving up. But I really, truly believe that you have to embrace your mistakes and move on. So I echo everyone's uh, sentiments. But mine is, um, I think, for what young women, um, especially, kind of to touch on some of the questions that people had. You should make your own opportunities. If you wait for people to give you them, they might never come. Right. So if you're waiting for the boys club to let you in or for the political power base to, to you know, your line to come, your, your ticket to come up, that might never happen. So definitely make your own opportunities. And then when you look back and you realize that you put yourself where you are, there's a lot of power in that. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what I would say.